So I was eating lunch out on a patio. Nice. Good weather. Nice outdoor meal. Yeah, it was nice, especially because like we were supposed to be grocery shopping, but I was so hangry that Kyle was like, there's a restaurant right there. Why don't you just like go eat? <laughs> <laughs> so I got See to you eat later. while he did the grocery shopping. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, this is like kind of bougie Mediterranean place, like one of those like fast casual situations. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was very tasty, but I did have to share the patio with some interesting characters. Ooh, okay. I was treated to the political stylings of two uptown young men discussing the idea of gun control and Christianity. Gun control and Christianity, all right? Yeah, and, and basically the state of conservatism. They're talking a lot of shit about their friend. Ooh. Oh, yeah, I love <laughs> gossip. So even people I don't know, apparently, I'm, I'm into it. <laughs> yeah. What was wrong with, you know, what was up with Chad? What was his problem? It was Sam, actually. <laughs> Mm, Shout okay. out to Sam. If you if you live in Uptown with two annoying roommates, that might be you. <laughs> but apparently he sounds like a freshman who, you know, just doesn't know what he's talking about, but still wants to pick fights with people. And, Ooh. But the, the kicker, the point where I like nearly spit out my freaking rice bowl <laughs> was they said, you know, some days he's like pretty conservative, but and some days it just sounds like he's a communist. And I'm like, wow, well, I'm I don't think this guy's a communist because the, what they had been talking about this guy was that this guy wants more gun control. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> yeah he doesn't sound like, very communist in that regard. Yeah, I was like, I don't think you, any of you all, all three of you, including the one that's not here, I don't think <laughs> any of you know what you're talking about. Oh, it was, it was fascinating. Good news from. The local cadre there in Uptown. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had a, a business card for our podcast because I just wanted to like leave it on the table as I left. Just like, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> you guys <laughs> if you need this. you want to get really mad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was interesting for sure. I got to hear the phrase, what about our missionaries in China? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah, we got to look out for for all that. You know, they throw people in jail for having Bibles there. Exactly. Yeah. They they talked a lot about the Bible and what it says about government control. And I was like, I didn't know it said that, but okay. You probably have read it, to be fair, and I haven't. So. <laughs> it's in, yeah. I mean, I'm kind of uneducated on the subject too, but people can derive anarchism from, <laughs> from reading Christian, you know, from reading the Bible. So there's, there's something to be said. It is whatever you want to make of it. And yeah, that's the thing is, you know, people will just pay attention to different verses, you know? So Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's that's the update from the front. We got a long way to go in converting the masses. Uh, yeah, yeah. Before we have people's revolutionary committees here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, we'll, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> so let's do it. <laughs> we are going to be talking about Vietnam. This is our part two of our Socialist Republic of Vietnam series. Part one was, what, two episodes back? Yeah, uh, I think that's right. Uh, and so, yeah, this is, you know, like we said before in that one, this is going to be a super broad survey. Part one covered Vietnam from its time as a French colony until it gained its effective independence. And part two will cover from the Vietnam War to the present day. Again, this is going to several times, like we could do an episode, for example, just on the Vietnam War, or just on Ho Chi Minh, there's there's several different uh, things we could springboard off into. We're we're going to try to keep it, try to keep it broad. So, do you want me to give you like the fastest summary ever of last episode? Because I just listened to it. Oh yeah, do it. <laughs> okay, great. So Vietnam, it was a French colony. It sucked. Uh, there were some nascent revolutionary action with some anarchists that didn't pan out, and then Ho Chi Minh shows up. He like. Travels around the world, starts some communist clubs, and then they like come back to Vietnam, basically. Mm -hmm. And there's like an up another communist uprising, and that one was like basically too soon, like <laughs> bad idea, guys. <laughs> yeah. And then World War II happened, and then Japan was occupying Vietnam, and it super sucked. So there was another uprising, and this one I think also got fucked up, right? Hold on, I'm looking through the notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, this one is when they started like the People's Army of Vietnam and you had General Giap mm -hmm. and 
Um, so they like started up their army and like the the United States was helping, which was weird. And then <laughs> Yeah. So they were fighting and then they they made Japan leave and they had like a conference and they're like, Well, we're gonna split up the country and that's kind of where we are now, right? Well, then you have the French occupying after. Oh, I yeah. Okay. So after French Japan, part France two. comes back. Back and worse than ever. <laughs> <laughs> that horrible ex is back. Yep. They're here to abuse you some more. And so then they do another war. That's the one where they have the big war, and it's like, it's it's on a it's not on a real rice bowl, but it's in like a pit basically. Mm-hmm. And so like the Vietnamese win, and uh, that's when they have another conference, the Geneva Conference, and they're like, we're going to split it up in north and south. North is communist. South is the state of Vietnam, which is really just like France in a trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, and by this point, you know, France is, is pulling out and kind of right on their heels, the <laughs> Americans are coming in. The Americans had yeah. already even been there. They had already, like you said, they were helping to fight against the Japanese, but then once the French are occupying again, the United States was helping France maintain that occupation. And so with the Geneva Conference splitting Vietnam into two, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam in the North and the state of Vietnam in the South, they say elections are going to be held in two years. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And the French are on their way out. The Americans are on their way in to help South Vietnam, the state of Vietnam. And so at that point, you have a 300-day window of free movement between the countries. That's ominous because it sounds like it's going to be not there in a minute. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, I guess. Right. Each (laughs) side can say, nope. You're not leaving now or whatever. Or no, you're not coming in. During this time, the CIA started a propaganda campaign, as they like to do, you know. Uh, And what they were trying to do was encourage Catholics to move from the north to the south. Oh, yeah, because Catholics were like anti-communist there. Uh, Yeah, this was mainly an attempt to kind of boost anti-communist numbers in the south to help stabilize the regime there, like to get themselves some fans, basically. And also they like knew there was an election coming up, so they needed more people to vote for them. <laughs> to be honest, like if you look at it, that's not really going to change things because there's going to be an election in the North too, right? So like both, it doesn't matter where they are really, but what they were oh, more concerned okay. with is some, you know, our government is unpopular. It might get overthrown before there even is an election. So <laughs> we need some fans quick. <laughs> okay, great. The, so I thought this kind of, uh, campaign was kind of interesting. They use slogans like Christ has gone south and... <laughs> The Virgin Mary has departed from the north. Okay. Like, (laughs) that's great. Just like, yeah, I saw him on the road, said hi. (laughs) He said, I'm out of there. Those communists, you know. (laughs) Not my thing. Yeah. (laughs) They want too much gun control. Oh, that would, yeah, that's probably what it was. (laughs) A million Catholics end up migrating south. Uh, More than 100,000 people living in the south move to the north, expecting probably that they're going to be moving back soon after being trained as insurgents. This is kind of a clever move to kind of reinsert some sleeper agents back into the South. And I think that maybe CIA and like, you know, American Western sources kind of overplay this a little bit. But on the other hand, it is kind of clever. So I don't want to detract and say like, no, they weren't doing this. Like this is kind of a smart move to train you some secret agents and then send them back. I don't think it was like on the scale that maybe America was reporting that it was, but <laughs> okay. And so, like we said, the U S is already starting to kind of step into the colonial role of France. What is the deal? Like, why are they doing that? Um, I mean, it's the domino theory, right? A hundred percent. Yes. That's what I <laughs> have written in reason. my notes. Uh, <laughs> good job. Yes. The domino theory. We don't want everybody becoming communists when they see, you know, some government fall to fall to communism. Fall then, you know, they might get the crazy idea that they also want to plunge into the deep, dark, despairing world of communism, you know? Uh, you, you know how when people see bad ideas, they're like, let me do that, that bad idea. That sounds great, yeah. You know, if your friends <laughs> jumped off a bridge, would you do it? If it, the bridge is communism, <laughs> you know, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but yeah, that's the stupid domino theory. Uh, God. Whereas, I guess, kind of the flip side of that is, apparently, whatever the communists are doing is pretty cool. Everyone wants to get on board with it. (laughs) Yeah, right. That is kind of what you're saying. (laughs) (laughs) There's also not just an ideological component to this, but there's a material and economic reason why 
the U.S. is doing this too. Uh, the more countries that go communist, the more countries join uh, the common terms trading block and everything. And they're, they're mainly trading with the Soviet Union and China and its allies. The fewer trading partners or people they can exploit, the capitalists have. That's a great point because I, I think you do often see this, like the Cold War and stuff like that set up as just a pure ideological war. Mm -hmm. When it's like, no, like, why do you think they, they don't like this? It means if these people are in a communist society and no longer willing to be exploited for like resources, like that means your, your stuff is going to get more expensive and like, you're not going to get to use their cheap labor and all that shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're not doing it for the, you know, oh, they're just so sad that the people there would be living under communism. Like, what about our missionaries in China? <laughs> right. It's not, it's, it's not enough for that. It's because it, it boils down to material reasons with an ideological superstructure of veneer to it that can, I, I think can influence people too. I mean, some people really were playing in this kind of headspace of good and evil, whatever. I, I think that's the message that was put towards the public. And like, I'm sure a lot of people bought it. For sure. So we reached this time period uh, right after the Geneva Convention when both sides are kind of consolidating their power, uh, their power base in, in their respective North and South Vietnam. So in North Vietnam, this looks like rent reduction and land reform. <laughs> I want to go to that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is a huge undertaking. And what they end up doing is expropriating tons of land from landlords all throughout even the rural village areas. And they're redistributing it to nearly 10 million peasants. It's a, it's a big deal. You've got now 10 million peasants who are, you know, firmly supportive of this new government uh, and its ideology because, I mean. You just got land. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole reason they have land now. This is not universally like a peaceful process. I'm sure. It's actually quite a violent one. And they, you know, end up killing people, uh, lots of them. And even to the extent where they go back later and say, we did, we had excesses. We targeted people we shouldn't have targeted people who weren't wealthy landlord enough to really mm. be targeted by this. And they died too. And they did aim to make restitution to people who were wrongly ex accused or wrongly robbed of their lands or what have you. And like, okay. sorry, you know, uh, but overall. It was really consequential in terms of its scope and getting 10 million people land, showing people concretely what the party was for, not abstract notions of we want to do this and that, but hey, we're the guys who did this for you. Yeah. Have some land. <laughs> yeah. And the organization that it takes to, to, to pull this off is like early training for uh, putting together, you know, tens of thousands of cadres of party operatives uh, having to be trained and go out to the peasantry and figure out who are the landlords, how do, you know, who do we need to take land from, who needs the land, all this sort of stuff. I mean, they are about to undergo like a major war right after a major war that they just fought. They need to, you know, build up their structure because they went from fighting one imperial power that was pretty powerful compared to them, but nothing compared to what they're about to fight. So did they kind of like know that was coming? No, they were fearful at this time that it was coming. Maybe they were worried that the U S might come in and, and start pulling some shit, but it wasn't like it wasn't on the table yet really. Okay. But I think with any communist state by that, I mean a, a state run by a communist party that's, you know, trying to do socialism. Since the Russian Revolution, you you see the template is the world is against you as soon as you take power. Yeah, so you better shore up while you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, that's what the North Vietnamese were doing. Let's take a look at what was going on in South Vietnam. So, in the state of Vietnam, the consolidation process looked like smashing their opponents, rigging elections, and doing reverse <laughs> land reform. Okay, so taking land away from the few peasants that had it and giving it to more landlords? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a <laughs> okay. bit. It's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> okay. Uh, so down there, the prime minister of the state of Vietnam was Ngo Dinh Zien, uh, and Bao Dai, that former yeah. emperor collaborator guy, was the head of state. This is really dumb, but I keep picturing Bao Dura from Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's, the, I think of him, I don't picture him, but I think of him every time. This guy, Ngo Dinh Zien, is interesting. He's very conservative. He's kind of ultra Catholic, 
and ultra anti-communist. Sounds like my kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, you and you and him would get along pretty oh, yeah. well, I think. For sure. Interesting Best dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, like I said, very conservative, very Catholic, very anti-communist. He had been a nationalist before. I mean, like he wants Vietnam to be independent, but he was like anti-communist. So when it came down to the first Indochina war, he was not willing to work with the Viet Minh against France. So he like stayed neutral, like a wow, loser. Wow, that sucks. Yeah. Uh, but I guess on the other hand, people still couldn't criticize him and be like, he was actually pro-French. Like, he didn't help them at all. Uh, so he was, you know, seen as a very strident nationalist still, but I don't know, one that wasn't willing to like do what it took, you know? Yeah. Like, well, how nationalist are you if you're like, well, no, not that way. <laughs> right. Yeah. And he's, he's su as nationalist as he was, he was that anti-communist. Like he was obsessed. Yeah. Yeah. One of those is definitely more important to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so he's the head of the government in the South and he sets about getting rid of his opponents in particular, two religious groups, the Kao Dai and the Hoa Hao. And he also went after an organized crime group uh, called the Bin Zhuyen. So are the religious groups not Catholic religious groups, I guess? Uh, no, they weren't. I'm realizing I don't know what like religious background like indigenous Vietnamese people would be. The majority were Buddhist. Oh, uh, okay. The Kao Dai is a kind of syncretic new religious movement officially established in 1926 which has kind of like, uh, you know, sees this one guy as like a prophet sort of thing. Uh, and then the Hoa Hao is like a su sort of Buddhist flavored, uh, kind of kind of an offshoot, I guess, of, of Buddhism. Uh, but he, he didn't like these guys. If you find yourself attacking Buddhists, like, geez. Uh, yeah, well, he will. <laughs> he, <laughs> okay. He was really mean about that. Jeez. And so anybody who was talking shit about him, he was going after, including his best friends, the communists. In the summer of 1955, he launched the Denounce the Communists campaign. <laughs> to the point. <laughs> Straightforward. And so this saw the arrest, imprisonment, torture, and execution of suspected communists. So, you know, our podcast would not have gone over well there. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I guess back then it would be a... A radio uh, show. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> It's time for the Communist Radio Hour. Call in with your questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Here comes the government. Uh, this never <laughs> happens. Welcome to the Catholic Radio Hour. We love Jesus here. The Virgin Mary is... It's She's the Virgin Mary the Radio Hour. Yeah. <laughs> the Southern Virgin Mary Hour. So, yeah. In August 1956, uh, he made any activity deemed communist punishable by death. Okay, so what was the scale here? Like, how many of these communists did he get? By November 1957, he had imprisoned more than 65,000. Holy mama. And killed more than 2,000. Wow. Okay, great. Yeah, not, uh, not a nice guy. So within a year, basically, rounded up a whole bunch of opponents. But that was he, what he was about. Anybody who was opposed to him, locked him up. Uh, then in October 1955, the state of Vietnam had a referendum. Would they set up a republic with CM as the president, or would they have a monarchy with Bao Dai as the emperor? <laughs> okay, one of those options is clearly, I don't know, Bao Dai didn't, like, I guess he killed some communists, I'm sure. He wasn't a good guy, and he was kind of an asshole in general. But so was Diem, so it's not a good choice. Yeah, it's bad choices all around. Uh, Diem had some interesting uh, ideas about kind of how to set up this free and fair election. Uh, for one, he banned campaigning for Baodai. Just couldn't do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just outlawed it. But it's cool for him to campaign. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, great. Why. Cool. Uh, he also sent the cops door to door threatening people into voting. For him specifically? Yes, basically for him, because they, they, it wasn't a secret ballot either. It mm. was like you would take like this green colored ballot or this whatever colored ballot, a red colored ballot, I think, for him to put it in the red box for <gasps> voting for him or a green one, which like in Vietnam was like a bad color or something. And oh. makes you were a loser. The green one to go to the green box to vote for the <laughs> other guy. Yeah, not a great election <laughs> process. Uh, he launched some government-funded parades with these giant floats of Bao Dai with bags of money on his shoulders <laughs> and decks of cards in his hands and, like, with 
naked blonde women and bottles of cognac in his arms. Oh my god, that's so funny. <laughs> you know, just portraying him as this like drunk gambling womanizer, which to be fair, Beaudet kind of was. He spent tons <laughs> of his time in France doing just that. Wow, okay. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, this election goes really, really well for ZM. <laughs> I mean, he kind of made it happen, but okay. Well, I mean, like, it also goes too well. His American advisors had told him, like, look, don't make this look too unrealistic. Like, 60, 70%, you know? But uh, he ended up getting 98.2% of the vote. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Maybe he had a really good float. <laughs> well, he, he did. It was so good. It materialized people to vote for him in Saigon. There were 450,000 registered voters and 600,000 people voted for him. Okay. Got some <laughs> ghosts voting. He quartered the ghost vote. So he won. And three days later, he proclaims the creation of the Republic of Vietnam instead of the state of Vietnam. And of course, he's president. South Vietnam, a little bit of a, I guess, a terminology government government organization change. As far as that reverse land reform goes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so when, during the first Indochina War, wherever the Viet Minh had control of a territory, which is mostly in the countryside, they had done some land reform. So in 1957, the U.S. urged South Vietnam to do some land reform to get themselves some popularity do something to help the people so that they don't hate you so much. Okay, did they do that or did they just hear the first part and not the second part about helping people? <laughs> yeah, that mostly. So they did some land reform, <laughs> but ZM's land reform was way less generous and way less fair than the land reform the Viet Minh had done in terms of like its impact on the majority of peasants. Basically, it was reverse land reform. The landlords end up getting more land. <laughs> Great, good job. And his officials, which he just appoints based on, like, if they're Catholic or not. Cool. That's a good metric. Yeah, they're very corrupt, very inefficient. And so they're just ripping off the system the whole time. Wow. Uh, it ends up with the opposite of its intended effect. People see the South Vietnamese government and their U.S. backers as being on the sides of landlords. So, so yeah, this, you know, the South Vietnamese government is helping out the landlords. This is going to make them less popular, right? Yeah. Uh, and make it easier for a future communist insurgency to kind of kick off a rebellion. All right, so that's kind of what each side was doing <laughs> during that little window of time. But then they have the reunification election coming up, right? Yes, that's right. Well, the South said that there was no way that there could be a free and fair election in the North. Wow, <laughs> that's rich. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was interesting coming from them. Yeah. Uh, so they refused uh, to hold the election. They're like, no way. We're not doing that. Oh, my gosh. Okay, cool. People argued about like different plans on how to monitor it ever. But the South was just like, no, we're just not doing it. So, wow. Classy move. Yeah. It was, you know, maybe smart on their part because like they would have just straight lost. Like they weren't that popular where they were. Although... The vote would have probably just been rigged in their favor there. They had fewer people than lived in the North, so. And they could just make up some ghosts. True. Yeah. All of a sudden, <laughs> their population is four million more I or don't something. happen. Everyone had a baby, and the babies grew up really fast and learned to vote. You know those Catholics. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay. No elections. Fine. In the South, there is a rising insurgency campaign that starts because of the shitty governance going on, right? Yeah, I mean, if you're giving land, imagine if like you're already paying rent to your landlord and you find out they got another building for free from the government. Like, from, yeah, from pissed? your friend that was taken from your, you know, like they <laughs> took it away from your buddy from work. Yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah, fucked up. And this insurgency campaign has domestic origins. So one of the big things that we're sold in the United States. And one of the big things we're trying to do with this episode is kind of break down myths that Americans and other capitalists, other people in capitalist countries are given. One of the things we're told is like the Vietnam War is the North Vietnamese trying to take over the South. And like within the South, you know, they're all against the communists. And it's, you know, anybody in the South that's like sympathizing with the communists, they're like, puppets of North Vietnam or whatever, which is not true. There is a lot of coordination with 
the North Vietnamese, with, with the Democratic Republic of Vietnam in terms of operations in the South. But this rebellion we're talking about that starts kind of in the countryside is also genuinely a response to how bad the government is in the South. Yeah, I mean, understandably so. They sound like they're not doing a great job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, people were suffering. They wanted change. The insurgency that starts in the late 1950s to the 60s is bloody. All right, it's it's. I mean, it's it's really violent, really cruel, real terrible. Uh, the insurgents against the South Vietnamese government they do an assassination campaign. Whoa, okay. They start killing government officials. Anybody working with the U.S. occupiers, any of that. And abducting people, too. They abduct hundreds of people as well. Oh, that sucks. I mean, they, they also got abducted. So, like, yeah. It is, you know, it is shitty. They would argue they, had, they were doing what they had to do. And this could be debated. In December 1960, the insurgency gets a little more official when they create the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam. All right, this is called, also, we'll just refer to this as the NLF. It is most commonly known to Americans as the Viet Cong. Yeah, okay, I've heard of that. I found that that is a contraction of the Vietnamese for either Vietnamese communist or communist traitor to Vietnam. <laughs> okay, that's that's a bit of a loaded term then. Yeah, so so as such, yeah, I, I think I'm going to go with the more official term of NLF <laughs> as much as I can remember to do so. <laughs> yeah, that's a good call. Wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, but just so you, so the audience knows, if, you know, most of the time you'll see Viet Cong. So when we're talking about the NLF, that's who we're talking about. Okay, cool. The NLF is a broad, united front against the South Vietnamese government, uh, which it called in its kind of announcement of, hey, we formed, here's what we're about. Uh, it calls the South Vietnamese government a disguised colonial regime of the imperialists. I mean, where's the lie? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> looks like it. Yeah, I mean, they're getting advice from the United States on how to rig their elections, so, like, not great. <laughs> yeah, the CIA's doing PR for them, like... <laughs> <laughs> they basically, like, have an office set up there and are running shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, they also set, them, set up an armed wing called the Liberation Army of South Vietnam. The NLF's, like, the political organization, and they have their own, like, kind of army or militia called the Liberation Army of South Vietnam. Uh, that mostly does guerrilla warfare insurgency, especially early on in the war. Later on, they'll go to more of a conventional warfare style thing. But right now, we're still even gearing up for war, really. So it's still kind of an insurgency sort of thing. Earlier, you were talking about whenever the borders were still open. I, I'm assuming they're closed now? Yes. Okay. So whenever they were still open, though, you were talking about North Vietnam sending people to South Vietnam. Were some of them in this NLF? Yes, for sure. Uh, the NLF's leadership um, was kind of shadowy. They they rotated positions a lot and didn't really publicize that so much. Probably a good call. <laughs> yeah, at least the central like central committee part of it, you could have like kind of more openly peaceful official type people who would be like, oh yeah, I'm you know kind of the face, but real decisions were were kind of more shadowy. And yeah, like you said, I think they were kind of building on that Marxist Leninist, you know idea of a vanguard party being a little secretive because you're facing like an impressive government, you know? I'm sure that's where the narrative came from of like, oh, this is an external army mm -hmm. or something. But it's like, yeah. first off, it wasn't all external. Like you can't just have like five guys from the north and then like, you know, a bunch of other people from there and say that it's external. Like those people had to agree to sign up, you know? Right. Yes. And they're recruiting throughout the throughout the war too. So like you know, they're not solely getting people from the North. I, I think for me, though, the bigger, like, refute to that argument is that it was supposed to be a fucking unified Vietnam if they had had the damn election. <laughs> so, like, fuck off. Yeah, this is all because the South refused to go along with it. Yeah, like, if it were a unified country, I'm willing to bet there'd be more fucking communists than, than other people. That's another thing that's really downplayed in the American story. You'll get that. Like, you can read it on the Wikipedia page, but it's not like what you're really told. You're kind of told that at some point the North invaded the South. Yeah, yeah, which it does not seem like that happened. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's definitely not the start of the war. So mm -hmm. the NLF wasn't openly communist. 
They're called the National Liberation Front, right? So more nationalists. So yeah, they're they're more like we want South Vietnam to be free of this, you know, oppressive colonial regime. Uh, their leadership is communist. But again, it's kind of secretive, and they're they're working, they're collaborating with uh, with the North, with the DRV. But overall, they're working with anybody who's against the South Vietnamese government. And they're like, you said they had an official declaration situation that wasn't communist. It was just like, hey, fuck these guys. Uh, no, so it's it is not openly communist. It doesn't refer to any real communist stuff. I mean, so sort of. I mean, right? It says carry out a broad and progressive democracy promulgate the freedom of expression of the press of belief, you know, so these are sorts of sort of liberal things, you know, to carry out land rent reduction, uh, guarantee the peasants right to till their present plots of land and redistribute communal lands. Okay. That's a little commie, a little flavor. It's a communist sort of idea, but they're not saying, you know, to, to see some <laughs> means of production. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're not using the lingo. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. interesting. That's interesting then that it gets branded as like, super fucking communist, which I mean, to be fair, yeah, the leadership was, but I, I do think that's interesting. It, and that was a deliberate strategy. Mm -hmm. The insurgency continues against Ngodin Ziem's uh, super corrupt and brutal dictatorship that he's got going there. Uh, one policy of the government, uh, of the South Vietnamese government that was particularly bad was the strategic Hamlet program. Mm, okay. Hamlet is in town, not the guy, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah, strategic. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're sometimes going to read Hamlet and <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be really moody and talk to skulls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like a small village. Uh, and this was started in 1962 uh, with the aid of the United States. What was this? The idea was to build these secure Hamlets or villages to protect South Vietnamese peasants and also to isolate them from being corrupted over to the dark side by the NLF. All right. So sounds like they're shutting villages like they're putting them on lockdown. Uh, a little bit worse than that. Oh, no. They are actually forcibly relocating people to these hamlets that <gasps> they build. Okay. I thought, oh, so they're building new hamlets. Okay, they're, great. Yeah. They're building new hamlets. They're burning down the old hamlets. And they're taking, you know, they're like, get your shit. You're coming to this place. Okay, so they're kind of building like prisoner of war camps, but for their own side. Uh, yeah, they've been wow. described as concentration camps in terms of like they're, you know, they're. I mean, they're oppressive. They they have constant surveillance from troops and watchtowers. You need oh. an ID at all times. You have to get permission to leave. Oh I mean, fuck no! Fuck these people! How could anyone? Okay, how much of this is secret? How could anyone be okay? Who, who would side with these people besides like the CIA because they're evil? Uh, well, the CIA and the United States were putting out these press releases that this was good, that they were maintaining safety and security, and they were improving their, you know, improving their quality of life by like building, you know, building these clean New villages or whatever. Towns. Yeah, but they weren't, <laughs> they just weren't telling people that <sighs> it was completely under lock and key. It just makes me so mad, like burning villages like i'm willing to bet a lot of those places have been around for like fucking thousands of years you know like what the fuck like that's Boom. horrifying yeah you're gonna love this war <laughs> oh no <laughs> it's uh it's it's great for maintaining you know yeah centuries old villages oh good <laughs> uh so yeah they lock them up like that uh the hamlet's administration they they were oftentimes really corrupt, ripping off the government aid that was supposed to be going to the people there. Because, again, it was all just incompetent Catholic guys. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but not all of them, although one of – this guy's interesting. So it was run by a guy named – he was a colonel named Pham Nguyen Thao, who was a secret communist agent. <laughs> okay. I want to go to that hamlet. If I got to go to a fucking hamlet, I'll go to that one. Well, he was in charge of all the hamlets. He was the – program runner what okay. how did he get into that was he he just like was super catholic on the outside so yeah he was a communist from uh before from when the Viet Minh were fighting right when the first indochina war was over he made this big show of renouncing communism i'm not a communist anymore i you know was just fighting for independence no way i'm not doing you know i've seen the error of my ways I love this. This is good inspo. Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, you know, and he comes from a Catholic family. So he was like, you know, kind of this returning to his faith, to his roots. 
<laughs> and ZM was like, I know he messed up with the cat with the communism thing, but like, he's a good Catholic. I can trust him because of that. And puts oh him in charge gosh. of this program, which he intentionally like makes it as shitty as possible to piss off as many people as possible and turn them against the government and in favor of the NLF instead. Interesting. That's okay. So I have mixed feelings about this because on the one hand, it's like, well, you're intentionally like making Being people an suffer. Asshole. Yeah. Yeah. But I understand why you. And also, I have a, I have a strong hankering that if this were run by any other of his goons, it would also be incompetent. You know. <laughs> like, yeah, that's the thing is that he pro he probably did make it worse or make it fail faster. Uh, but it probably wasn't going to be a you know a peaceful fun experience for people even if it was run by the government you're right i mean at the end of the day they fucking kicked you out of your village and burned it down i don't care if you're taking me to fucking six flags i'm still gonna be <laughs> mad about it <laughs> uh, yeah for sure so i mean he succeeds at making it bad uh the, the program fails and it gets canceled in late 1963 i mean i love this as a blueprint for my political career soon like right when i'm about to run for school board or something i'll just be like Oh, just kidding. I fucking hate communism. And I was raised Catholic, so like I'm super Catholic now. <laughs> and then get in there and just fuck everything up. Just be like, nope. <laughs> Actually, no. Sorry, I lied. So that was one pretty bad That's super thing rough. that they were doing. Another bad policy of the government was discriminating against the majority of the population who were Buddhist. ZM, hyper Catholic. His government actually went around to places and forced them to convert. Uh, Ooh, no. If they wanted to receive food aid at all, or if they didn't want to like get kicked out of their homes and sent to one of these hamlets, <gasps> they would force them to convert. Fuck that. Fuck this guy. And so you did have like villages, you know, converting en masse to, to avoid that fate. Oh my God. Uh, also when he did land reform, the few, you know, the little bit of land that he did confiscate and give to people or whatever. Uh, none of those guys were, were the Catholic church, which was the largest landowner in the country. It was completely exempt from <gasps> land reform. Okay. This fucking sucks. <laughs> oh. Uh, so yeah, people agreed with your take on this in South <laughs> Vietnam. They started protesting, uh, and they were attacked and killed by the police, by the army. Fuck. Uh, May 8th, 1963, they kill nine protesters. They just open up with like firearms and grenades. Jesus. The movement grows, demanding religious equality between Buddhists and Catholics. But ZM is like, no, fuck that, and cracks down on dissenters. Uh, and on June 11th, a guy named Thich Quan Duc set himself on fire. <gasps> oh, okay. I know this story. Yeah. Yeah, this is the, the monk that sets himself on fire story. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. He was the Buddhist monk uh, who self-immolated on a busy intersection in Saigon, protesting against ZM's regime. Wow. Damn. That's where that uh, comes from. That's a that's one of our old childhood stories. I don't know why. <laughs> Grady had like a, a history book and one time we turned it to a random page and that was the story. And like I had jokingly been like, tell me a story before bedtime. And that was a story we'll flip to. And so we're like, all right, sweet dreams. It like, was gruesome. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was just, horrifying. Well, anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sleep well. Uh, That's super fucked up. I just want to do a quick recap because people love to talk about like the horrors of communism. Mm -hmm. So far in this regime, we've had completely rigged elections. We've had religious discrimination. We've had burning town villages. We've had just killing protesters. This is a lot. Uh, yeah. Concentration camps. Like, what? what? This these is are the good guys. Yeah. These, this, are, these, yeah, are, the these are the good guys that we're going to support. As the United States. This is freedom and democracy. That's That looks exactly like freedom and democracy to me. Yeah. Uh, this is not to say that, and we'll get, you know, we'll get into this, that the, over the course of the war, the NLF and the- They do some shit too, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, the North Vietnamese army. Yeah, they're not, they're not saints. It's hell on both sides. But, but yeah, you're right. This is, uh, the these are the people we're propping up and this is what they're doing. You have the understandable revulsion to this situation, to people resorting to killing themselves to protest. Uh, the de facto first lady of South Vietnam, Madame Nu, who was actually ZM's sister-in-law because he was a bachelor, reacted in a quite different way. She said, 
Let them burn and we shall clap our hands. If the Buddhists wish to have another barbecue, I will be glad to supply the gasoline and a match. Holy shit. Fuck that lady. Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> I found that particularly monstrous. Yeah, what the fuck? So, eventually people... <laughs> Eventually, people had enough of Zian. And I even, think I have. <laughs> going to get in yeah. my time machine and go fuck some people up. Uh, well, don't worry. That's what they're going to do. Great. Uh, even people in the government, you know, wanted him gone. He was fucking stuff up like we've just seen with these programs, but also militarily. Uh, so the, the South Vietnamese Army was called the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. The abbreviation for that is ARVN, like A-R-V-N. ARVN and the chipmunks? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> mm. But monks is spelled M-O-N-K-S because they're Catholic. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's pretty good. Thank you. Uh, they were getting their ass kicked by the NLF at that time. Well, just, they're just monks. <laughs> complete mismanagement at all levels, basically. And so the generals were just saying, this is DM's fault. Uh, they get to talking about doing a coup against him in late 1963. And the CIA gets on the phone and tells the, the generals, you know, <laughs> like... I don't know. That's we're not saying to do it, but that likes that's not a bad idea. Uh, we wouldn't like <laughs> cut off aid for you or anything like that if you happen to like do that. Oh my Just god! Saying. Like, I don't have any experience doing this. I I wouldn't know, but. If you did it, here's how. <laughs> yeah, and just so you know, we won't be upset if you did yeah. that. Like. Hypothetically, of course. They give them the green light. Uh, oh November 2nd, 1963, they overthrow ZM and they execute him and his brother Ooh. and put in a military junta. His brother was executed because he was his closest advisor. It's not like he was just chilling at the house. He was <laughs> yeah. he was involved in all this. Well, and he also had that shit wife, so like he deserves to <laughs> die for her alone. <laughs> Fair enough. So, well, you know, maybe he didn't, but he he was an asshole too. I don't want to okay, apologize yeah. for him. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thing with this is sometimes people play it up like, like President Kennedy at the time was super shocked by this and he makes a kind of a, a play at that. But then he later on sends a telegram basically saying like, hey, good job handling this sort of thing. <laughs> So I'm pretty sure, oh. and, and historians debate, but I'm pretty sure that he at least tacitly knew about it, or if not gave the green light, you know, but that's not proven. But didn't he have a contentious relationship with the CIA? Did he already have that by this point? Uh, by this point, yes. Yeah, he had. Def he definitely already had it. So they might not have been telling him everything or just telling him later and he had to like cover his shit. I'm not to be a Kennedy apologist or no, something. No, that's, it's possible. It's possible. Um he may have just been like playing along like, well, shit, it happened. Uh, good job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, that makes sense. But we'll, we'll kind of get into America's involvement here. I guess it, it's real hands on because they're already at this point, they're already involved <laughs> yeah, since the French calls. left. But uh, yeah, let's get into the meat of this rising conflict. Okay. Wartime. Yeah. This is known in America as the Vietnam War. Uh, sometimes it's also known as the Second Indochina War. If you're like an old person who remembers the first one, you're like, oh, this again. <laughs> yeah. And in Vietnam, it's called the Resistance War Against America. I feel like I fight that every day. <laughs> <laughs> Not at this scale, at least. No, no, no. Uh, I guess it's interesting because we've already been kind of talking about the lead up to it. And like we said, America has already had an involvement there. And there's already a counterinsurgency going. So people, I guess historians kind of have different lines to draw as far as when it starts. And we'll talk about that too. But so like any military history, we're just going to hit, you know, the low lights, I guess. We're just going to hit Not the key turning bag. points. Yeah. <laughs> the major events and stuff. You can find some white guy who like is really into that. I'm sure there's a podcast like this is the war podcast. <laughs> oh yeah. There's gotta be a multi-part or like three hour long YouTube thing on it for sure. I'm sure. Honestly, it's worthy of it. Like we could do an entire episode on the Vietnam War because and from our point of view, there's enough of it, not just military history stuff, but enough like enough of the conflict between like you were saying, this is what capitalism is actually doing. This is what freedom and democracy looks like to them. And we can we could really get into that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we should, for sure. But yeah, you you're right. We're we're not we're not gonna cover all that today. Yeah, and we're not gonna get heavy into military stuff like we never do. Right. So. Yep, yeah. It's just not our thing. <laughs> uh so first off it's interesting in terms of its categorization. The main opponents 
in this war are North Vietnam, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, versus South Vietnam, the Republic of Vietnam, with, of course, a heavy dose of the United States involved. <laughs> also, they're friends. But yeah, so in this context, it seems like it might be considered a civil war, right, between Vietnam. I was just going to say that. Like, why aren't they calling it a civil war? There's an argument to be made for that in that both of them want to govern the whole country. So essentially, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the help that each side gets versus what they're putting in for themselves, it kind of becomes more clear, I think, that it's more of a war of occupation. North Vietnam does get help from other countries. Uh, China sends hundreds of thousands of troops to North Vietnam, which kind of frees them up to send troops to fight in the South. Uh, they end up sending like $143 billion worth of aid to North Vietnam. That's in today's dollars. The Soviet Union also helps. Uh, you also have other Eastern Bloc countries. You have uh, North Korea, uh, East Germany, uh, Cuba, um, all sorts of communist countries pitch in however they can. Uh, quick question. Yeah. What's up with Laos and Cambodia? Where did they end up after the conference? Because I know they were like kind of in Indochina, like lumped in there for a minute. So so both Laos and Cambodia end up independent, but as kingdoms. And they're pretty reactionary. There end up being like communist uh, rebellions in each one of them. Uh, in Laos, they have the Pathet Lao party, like the communist party there, basically. Uh, and in Cambodia, you have the Khmer Rouge. I've heard of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because of um, what's his name? The guy that we like. And he talks about media. Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a song, apparently, while my brain had to think of his name. The Noam Chomsky jingle. Yeah, so <laughs> the governments there, officially, they were these reactionary, basically pro-South Vietnam, pro-United States regimes. Uh, and so we'll see in a little bit, the, the war kind of does branch out to them as well. Uh, and the North Vietnamese and the NLF are going to work with the communist parties there as part of a broader sort of struggle. Uh, but yeah, so they're getting help from these other countries, but I would argue that none of these countries really bear the majority of the burden of the war. North Vietnam and the NLF are the ones doing the fighting, doing the dying. They're taking advantage of these material resources, but they're also pumping in their own. And I think that they're the ones who take the lion's share of the sacrifice and ultimately the victory in the end. Whereas on the other side, right, if it's a civil war, you got to have two sides from the same country. On the other side, South Vietnam, the ostensible other half of the civil war, was overwhelmingly financed by and eventually just militarily defended by the United States. Okay, yeah. Like, do we have any percentages on, like, how many troops were American versus actually Vietnamese? America sent in 543,000 troops in Vietnam at its peak, like, at one time. That was in 1969. Over the course of the war, they would have more than 3.1 million troops serve there. Oof. So tons and tons and tons. If you're looking at South Vietnam, like their peak numbers are 850,000 in 1968. You don't really have like a good cumulative number for them, but they, I mean, they eventually they do end up with the, you know, with the majority there, but that's once, uh, once the United States is trying to draw down. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, if anything, it's like, 50 50 or something you know right which is nowhere near the case in uh north vietnam and the nlf this is kind of a stupid question yeah does this happen a lot in civil wars <laughs> like i don't remember reading anything about foreign intervention in like the american civil war no and certainly not in not to this extent not to yeah not to that extent like when we talk about the spanish civil war they did have foreign involvement but the majority of people fighting in that were spanish on both sides you know, I mean, even, you know, sure. Yeah, the fascists, they had the Condor Legion and stuff. They had assholes helping them. But even so, the fascists were still, for the most part, in Spain. You know, I mean. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction. Because, yeah, you could absolutely be like, yeah, somebody's fighting for their freedom. And it's like, who? <laughs> Who's actually doing it? One In this case, I think one side would just not exist if it weren't mm -hmm. for foreign intervention. And that's, I think, the big distinction. The U.S. puts in around $1.4 trillion of today's Oof. dollars into the country over the course of the war. They, okay. I mean, when we'll see when they leave that South Vietnam just fucking collapses. Like, they, it's a very, it's, it's a Potemkin, you know, it, it's a facade, I guess. There were, I don't want to say there were no people supporting it. But it's just not enough. I mean, it's not enough to hold its own. 
Yeah, yeah. Numbers wise, it just does not add up. Yeah. So that's why I would argue against the Civil War and more as a occupation war. All right. So let's hit that low light reel. Okay. What happened in this war? <laughs> All right. So the overall trend from the American perspective, you can see this as a bipartisan failure. You have lots of presidents overseeing America's escalating involvement in Vietnam. I mean, it, it's, it lasts, uh, advisors are first on the ground in 1955, you know, basically right after when the French leave. <laughs> yes, yes, I remember. And even before that, didn't you have like some OSS people, like baby CIA? Well, you had OSS before against the Japanese, and then you had CIA people helping the French actually flying planes during the Battle <laughs> oh, of Tien yeah, Bien right, Phu. Right. So it starts real early. By 1965 is when you get the first uh, real ground troops there officially, mm -hmm. you know, and the last American presence doesn't actually leave troops uh, in 73. And then officially anybody like from the embassy in 75, that's nearly 20 years. Jesus. It's Eisenhower, a Republican, Kennedy, a Democrat, Johnson, a Democrat, Nixon, a Republican and Ford, a Republican. Yeah. Once again, like it doesn't matter who's in charge. Like we want to do imperialism. Yes. Yeah. Even when you get to the point where people are in Congress, you know, some people are opposing the war. Most of them are opposing it for self-interest. It's too expensive or too bloody or it makes us look mean or we didn't follow the right procedure or it's unpopular or whatever. Not because they're opposed to empire, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like you have it, it's very unpopular like among the people too after a certain point. Yeah. So I guess overall, we're going to see a trend of escalation very, very gradual in the early years through Eisenhower and Kennedy. Then a huge escalation under Lyndon Johnson, and then a <laughs> a kind of two faced like, oh, we're going to draw back, but we're actually not sort of thing from Nixon at first before he <laughs> finally draws all the way down, and then Ford is just in charge of like getting out. That's the overall pattern. Let's get into the details. 1959, you have the beginning of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. All right, what's that? This is um the very beginning of the of a change in the strategy from North Vietnam, which initially was just going to go with that election, right? But when it was clear that wasn't going to happen, they're like, okay, well, we need to help the insurgents in the South to liberate themselves. So in January 1959, they approve of a people's war on the South. We're going to help them get free of that bullshit stuff down there. And so they start setting up the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is this super complex transportation network from the North through Laos and Cambodia into South Vietnam. So like it goes around the border and then into South Vietnam. Ooh, I want to Google it. There's a picture on the Wikipedia page. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is, that is a convoluted route. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it starts out as this series of footpaths and just, I mean, it's really, it it's like a six month journey to traverse it. And you're going through really difficult terrain on foot, on bicycle, on boat. It's rough. But over the course of the war, they eventually developed this into a fully paved road, like a four-lane highway all the way down, basically. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. So this is just to get like troops and supplies down to the south. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They okay. set up a brigade that is in charge of like building this whole thing. It's this massive – it's – I don't know. It's, it's, it's really impressive that they're able to – build this and, and disguise it because they are also getting bombed nearly the whole time that they're trying to do that. Yeah. So at this point, were the Americans involved yet? Uh, the Americans at this point have advisors. Okay. But no troops yet. No troops yet. Although the advisors are like right there with the army and you know, they probably pick up a gun now and then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next up we have Kennedy's escalation in 1960 to 1963. He's basically just doing whatever he can to prop up the regime of DM while he's still <laughs> around. And so he's increasing the military advisors start at 900 from the Eisenhower years. And he pumps that up to 16,000. Jesus. That's a lot of dudes. Yeah. Just advising though, of course. Yeah. yeah of course. <laughs> They've never shot anyone. It, and it's, and it's gradually like it's the whole time America is trying to put in just enough to, to win, but they don't want to commit too much because they don't want to ask for too much. You know, because the whole thing's pseudo off the books. Uh, oh, okay. Out of public, especially at this stage with the advisor, it's mostly out of public sight. Like, really, only like the intelligentsia, the, the columnists are talking about it. 
Everyone else is kind of like, eh, no one's being drafted for it yet. He's, you know, and this is this is why he's he's putting in advisors, backing up that strategic Hamlet program, and ultimately, it's why he ends up betraying ZM and letting him get cooed is because he wants to do whatever it takes to keep the government going, even if it's not with that guy eventually. Okay, I just do want to reiterate: we did fund concentration camps. Good job, America. Oh yeah, 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 totally. And Kennedy, you know, he gets his pass, I think, from liberals. They like to paint him as like this peace loving guy, you know, but he was totally a cold warrior. I mean, he was in it. He was totally anti-communist. It's while he's president that Alan Dulles in the CIA. Mm, I hate that guy. He's like, we should just put like a no sign Alan Dulles face. Like a new t-shirt. <laughs> uh, a wanted dead or alive or something. I don't know. I don't know if you can put bounties out for dead people. Ironically, but <laughs> <laughs> you can piss on their grave. Yeah. He was doing this secret operation called Operation 34A. And it was this series of covert actions like recon missions and inserting like secret ops people and, and naval sabotage against North Vietnam. This is going back to the Eisenhower years, but Kennedy was still letting that go. He knew about that. So when we say we only had advisors in there, we definitely had other people in well, there. Yeah, and we were pulling <laughs> shit. We were doing active – we were taking active measures against North Vietnamese government, who Jesus. we were theoretically not at war with. Great. Cool. All right. So next, uh, Kennedy gets assassinated, November 22nd, 1963. Whoops. Lots of mysterious shit that we're not going to get into, but it ends up <laughs> making Lyndon Johnson president. And he's definitely a war hawk, more outwardly so. Than Kennedy, who kind of has to put on this, he's sort of Obama-esque in that sort of like, I'm very <laughs> disciplined, you know, I really don't want to do this. I'll look but really sad drugs. when I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'll look really sad when I'm bombing those people, but yeah. <laughs> God. Uh, and, and Lyndon Johnson doesn't have that so much of that restraint, but I mean, again, Kennedy was escalating the whole time. So let's not pretend that he was going to, you know, world peace it. And it's when Johnson is president for not that long uh, that we have the Gulf of Tonkin incident. All right. I feel like I've heard of this. I don't know what happened, but it sounds familiar. Yeah. This is what officially starts America's like troop involvement. <laughs> On the books involvement. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's uh, August 1st, 1964, that commandos with that secret operation we talked about, they did a raid against a North Vietnamese radio transmitter. Okay. It's like a, like a tower? Yeah, it was it was like a like a buoy out in the water actually. And so they go and they go and attack that. And this had been going on covertly for a while, like we said, all those missions, you know. Uh, so North Vietnam sends out some patrol boats armed with torpedoes to intercept this ship that's hanging around in the area, the USS Maddox. And it was hanging around in the area, not for a nice little sightseeing cruise, uh, but to spy on radio communications in the area. Uh, and it was also in, it was within North Vietnam's territorial waters. So the Maddox hears the radio chatter of, of this ship that's approaching it, hears them and the claims that they're saying that they're going to attack. So it fires some warning shots at the North Vietnamese boats and they return fire. And so the Maddox then fires some more at them and then the, the boats turn and flee. And one of them gets sunk by a jet that the, that the Americans scrambled over there and Shit. one of them. Uh, sinks a boat. So we did shoot first, just saying. Not that it super matters, but uh, <laughs> we were spying on them and got caught and then shot first. Yes, yeah, 100%. Uh, two days later, the Maddox goes back out there. And this is, you've mentioned this before, as a nice little American trend of ours, uh, of wars that start when people are swinging their dicks around, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. The, the you disrespected me war. Yes. We went back out there in order to, quote, show the flag, basically to say that they weren't scared after what happened. Oh, my God. We're still here. We're not afraid, you know? <laughs> it's fucking idiots. Yeah. So they go out there, and this is what's great. They don't even encounter anything, but there's this really rough weather and they misread their signals, they ba like their radio signals and shit like that. And they basically uh -huh. get jumpy and they think that there's another attack by these <gasps> torpedo boats that are coming in. And so they just start shooting. <gasps> okay. So they go out there being like, I'm not scared. And then like, <laughs> and then wait, I'm actually scared. very scared. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Idiots. I love it. They radio back in and they're like, yeah, we sunk these two, these, these two DRV boats, you know, they're, they're down, you know, we, we got them. We got the bogeys. There's no wreckage ever found, no bodies recovered, no evidence oh, that any boats okay. were ever there. 
So they just shot at like some rocks or something. No idea. They just shot. They got uh, like fucking scared. And but this was enough when this was radioed back in and they brought it, Mr. President. <gasps> it was enough for him to run to the TV cameras, emergency, interrupt your broadcast to tell you that American ships had been attacked unprovoked on the high seas and we just had to respond immediately. Sorry, what? Yeah. <laughs> we got attacked by ghosts, so we're gonna start a war. Well, the first attack, remember, did technically happen, although it wasn't unprovoked, and it wasn't in international waters. <laughs> but details, <Wow>. details. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about that. So he says, we've got to respond immediately. And three days mm. later, responding to his request, Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, authorizing President Johnson to do military operations in Southeast Asia, quote, to take all necessary steps basically to do whatever he wanted all without okay. a declaration of war. Okay. Yeah. Wait, I, mm. so is this first time we do that shit? I mean, we've done like shady shit. Korea was also a police action. What the fuck is that? It's just an undeclared war. We haven't declared war since world war two. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was going to say, we don't do that anymore. Yeah. Nowadays there's the authorization for the use of military force, AUMF, which that's what they use for the war on terror. Uh, which is why they can just do that everywhere. Do whatever the much. fuck they want. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. The great thing about this Gulf of Tonkin resolution, aside from it just being built on a lie, right? <laughs> yeah. Is that uh, Lyndon Johnson had actually already launched a bombing campaign called Operation Pierce Arrow before Congress passed their thing. <laughs> he just kind of assumed they would pass it. Right, yeah. Uh, and this is the <laughs> beginning of the American bombing campaign of Vietnam, which over the course of the war will drop nearly four times the tonnage of bombs as the U.S. dropped during the entirety of World War II. Holy shit. Yeah. That's a lot of bombs. It is. So basically, yeah, the U.S. gets its authorization for invading Vietnam with ground troops based on bullshit. <laughs> oh, my God. That's insane. Like... I want that to be like an Unsolved Mysteries episode of like, where are the ghosts of the Gulf of Tonkin? Who <laughs> shot that noise? It's crazy. Uh, apparently, Johnson even admitted privately later on, he said, for all I know, our Navy was shooting at whales out there. <laughs> That's really bad. Oh, whale shooting. Also not great. But <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. What, would the, what the fuck? Yeah. But okay. So that's how it started. And uh, yeah, a year later, uh, U.S. troops will land uh, in 19, this is 1965 in Da Nang. They'll be the first troops of many mm. to start showing up. What happens next? So right around this time, you also have the launching of something called the Phoenix Program. All right. Cool name. I bet I won't like it. It's not cool because it's a program run by the CIA. I definitely don't like it. Tell me more. <laughs> All right. You thought that was bad. Uh, it is designed to identify and quote unquote neutralize the NLF and anyone who sympathized with them. Okay, great. So we're going to go do some murders. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to do some infiltration of their party and their whole organization, kidnappings, torture, and assassinations. Mm. Okay. Over the course of its reign of terror, it neutralized. And with that, this is actually a broad, it's not necessarily killing. All right, but it targeted and, and did something to 81,000 people, more than that, actually, uh, who were suspected of being NLF members and killed more than 26,000 of them. Oof. Okay. So, sorry, neutralized made it sound like they went up to them. They're like, you want to change your mind about communism? They're like, yeah, I'm neutral now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, lots of those are people who they tortured into betraying their side or into, you know, being just arrested and serving some time and not doing revolutionary activities anymore or what have you neutralized in all sorts of pleasant ways like that. Mm, okay. This also definitely included civilians. It was gruesome. We're not going to get into it. Barbaric torture stuff, the assassinations of people, the, these, I mean, they just get kill lists, you know, they're based on people's testimony. You know, if they get the Intel that you're NLF, they're going to go after you. Fuck. So just gossip. Well, yeah, they, you know, when, Oh, we have multiple sources or whatever, but multiple gossip, right? <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. Just a guy. <laughs> Uh, they, they get an informant and like put a bag over his head so nobody could see who this guy was, but they would take him and like poke holes for his eyes and they'd take him through the town and they'd point out your house, you know, of whoever the fuck it was. Uh, so, but that way they, you know, 
couldn't retaliate against this guy or whatever. And then they'd bust in that night and kill whoever was there, assuming that it's the target. I mean, including the family members, whoever they, they were wiping Whoa. out that house. Okay. Yeah. Now this is a moment where you start putting out your Catholic saint statues in your yard. Be like, nah, man. <laughs> I, I, see, look, it's St. Francis. I, I'm not communist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a gruesome program. It is pretty effective. I mean, it does like really take out a lot of NLF people. Um, it's eventually shut down in 1972. Once people kind of find out about it, there's this big congressional hearing and stuff. And they're like, whoa, America's running this horrible, <laughs> a horrible campaign. <laughs> Imagine that. That's never happened before. Yeah. So they shut it down and actually instead secretly continued it under the direction of the South Vietnamese <laughs> government under the name Plan F6. Okay, so they just transferred operations. Yeah, in 1972, they were just like, it's your problem now. You do it, and there yeah. you go. Yeah, here's how to do it. I wrote the book on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Jesus. Uh, yeah, so that's the Phoenix program. It's a lovely little bit of work. That was throughout the course of the war, 1964 to 1972. Uh, next up. We're moving from the Gulf of Tonkin, right? And, and American troops are be first being put in. And now we're going to start kind of talking about the war of attrition phase. All right. What's that? So the U S strategy here by general William Westmoreland, uh, who predicted that America was going to win this war by 1967. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> uh, basically he was going to win this war of attrition. They're going to wear down gradually the NLF and the North Vietnamese army. Uh, and they're just, you know, they're going to go out there and kill them. And that's it. They're going to win eventually. How hard could it be? <laughs> uh, the the whole killing the enemy thing, the, the, the strategy here was going to be accomplished by search and destroy missions. Okay. The idea here is you take your troops, put them in a helicopter, go take, go to hostile territory, find some enemies, kill them and leave. Now, you might be asking a question, all right? I know you're in the corporate world. You need to find out how am I going to know what success looks like? What are going to be my metrics, right? Oh, no. You got to build a PowerPoint. You got to get some data. Oh, yes. delicious. An Excel spreadsheet. And the, uh, yeah. <laughs> and the Secretary of Defense was a guy named Robert McNamara. Oh, fuck this guy. And Robert McNamara... He had gone to Harvard Business School. <laughs> so he's smart. Yeah, he had been, um, you know, president of Ford Motor Company. So he knew about, you know, making making sure that this was efficient. So he came up with a metric to figure out what will success look like. And it was called the body count. Is that as straightforward as it sounds? It really is. Yeah, you count the enemy dead and you'll know when you're winning when the numbers are high enough. <laughs> oh, my God. So just indiscriminate killing at that point. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's what it leads to is not strategic at all. For one, you can just lie. You can just say, "Oh, yeah, man, we killed 50,000, you know, <laughs> 50,000 enemies yesterday, you know." You can, you can say that. For another thing, you can get indiscriminate with it. Like you said, cut corners to get the numbers. Yeah, cuz if you're just going like on a helicopter in a in a country you're not familiar with, I'm betting, and you're just going to go find a random village and be like, well, it's in the North Vietnam, so like we did it. Like That's not a strategic victory in any way. It's also just a horrible thing to do. Yeah, that's <laughs> they, they do a, a very grim joke about this in the movie Full Metal Jacket, uh, which is about, I mean, it's a fictional portrayal or whatever, but it's about Vietnam. And it's set there. And you've got this helicopter machine gunner that's just gunning people down out of the, like in fields and stuff, you know, out of the. Mm -hmm. out of the helicopter and like, yeah, yeah. You know, cheering himself on. He tells this new recruit guy, he says, anyone who runs is a VC Viet Cong, right? And anyone who stands still is a well-disciplined VC. <gasps> oh my God. And uh, what he's talking about there is not entirely fictional because this is basically what you would call a free fire zone. And this is where, uh, you know, U S military command, they designate an area uh, where they say, you know, we've we've secured this place. There are there are no friendlies here. We've removed them. Nothing good is here. Any un unidentified people should be considered enemy combatants and mm. shot on sight. Oh my god! And so that will get you your body count numbers because everybody you're killing there is an insurgent. Yeah, including I'm sure like just children and shit. Like what the fuck? Uh, yeah. 
Real quick note, I did think Full Metal Jacket was an anime. No, that is Full Metal Alchemist. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a very different thing. Uh, lest you think that this sort of barbarism is a relic of the past uh, in America's war in Afghanistan, we had such low civilian deaths because any military-aged males, anyone 18 or older, were considered enemy combatants. Oh, my God. So... We modernized it a little bit, but we were still body counting, basically. So we're, we're fighting for their freedom, unless you're an 18-year-old and up male, and then you're dead. Right. And back then, it wasn't even that picky. There's a quote from Marine Officer Philip Caputo, who was talking about this and just how brutal it was. It says, this led to practices such as, as counting civilians as Viet Cong. If it's dead in Vietnamese, it's VC. You know, that was our rule of thumb, basically. Wow. That's yeah. fucked up. Pretty bad system. Right, the body count system. Yeah, bad both like in terms of effectiveness and morals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was supposed to be working, uh, and that's what the generals were saying. That's what the president would go out and say on TV. Well, if you're making your own metrics, then you you can say whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> <laughs> if you determine what success is. Yeah. So this phase of the war, 1965 to 1968, you're looking at President Lyndon Johnson going out there on TV and saying we're winning, you know, and he'd have his generals come out there. They'd say, we're winning. We see there's light at the end of the tunnel. We're almost there. Victory is at hand. And people were, you know, kind of questioning this a little bit and stuff. And, you know, there was an anti-war movement throughout all this. But by and large, Americans still supported the war. Uh, this is until January of 1968, uh, when the NLF and the People's Army of Vietnam, so the North Vietnamese Army, launched the Tet Offensive, which was this massive attack on Arvin and American forces throughout South Vietnam. Most towns, most villages throughout South Vietnam were hit. Basically, the goal here for North Vietnam was to trigger a popular uprising, basically, uh, and the collapse of the South Vietnamese government. Which, like, probably wouldn't be hard to do. Well, that's what they thought. They figured that this would this would just topple everything. You know, it's and it's called the Tet Offensive because it was launched during the Lunar New Year Festival of Vietnam, uh, Tet Nguyen Dan. Oh, I've heard of that. Yeah, and. Basically, the idea was that most Arvin soldiers would be on leave, and so get, you're kind of catching them on their heels, you know? Oh, shit. Okay. It lasted from January 31st to March 28th, and then it had a couple more phases later on, lasting till September. Overall, how the Tet Offensive worked, the surprise part, it did. It, it caught people by surprise. Uh, they were able to really inflict a lot of casualties on Arvin and, and American forces, uh, but the United States and South Vietnamese, they were able to rally a defense. They drove back the NLF and the North Vietnamese forces, and they really inflicted disastrous casualties on them. I mean, it was really uh, bad. Okay. Uh, some 45,000 killed and 60,000 wounded. The communists, if you're looking at this from just a military standpoint, just tactically, what, you know, what did the Tet Offensive look like for them? I mean, it was devastating. So who were they? They were attacking the army still. Because you just said, you said that they attacked the town. So like, I guess I was just like, are they like raiding towns and shit? Or like, what's the deal? The towns were occupied. You know, I mean, they, they had military garrisons there. So they were basically besieging the towns. Okay. Even driving into like close to the American embassy in Saigon and stuff. Like they were, it was close. You know, they, so they they're, were. So they're still doing like military targets just within a town. Right. Yes. Okay. I mean, it's it's pretty disastrous for them in terms of people lost. They put like every, you know, so much of what they had into this. And we're really turned back. The popular uprising did not happen. The South Vietnamese government remained in place. The American occupation was still there. I mean, it is a loss. Yeah, absolutely. But strategically, big picture wise, it does end up really, really, really paying off. In terms of the political scene. How so? Well, remember what the warmonger leaders in America have been telling people. We've got the enemy on the ropes. We're about oh, to win. Oh, shit. Just be patient. It's a little bit longer and we'll be victorious. We've killed however many hundreds of thousands of these guys. There are barely any of them left. We're almost done. And then they launched this huge attack with like the people you said were dead. Like <laughs> yes. those guys are attacking you. Uh-huh. It's, they are just exposed. I mean, they were lying and people are pissed. They've been told one thing and all of a sudden, how did they mount this attack? Like, you call this winning? What the heck? And they're oh seeing this gosh. on the nightly news day after day. I mean, that's months, January 31st through March 20, 28th. Yeah, that is a long time. 
and they are just seeing carnage, you know, from an enemy that was supposed to be near defeat. So you have a huge swing in American support for the war. Even Walter Cronkite, the anchor for CBS, like the most trusted man in America sort of thing. <laughs> he gets on TV on a broadcast and says that, we, you know, America was mired in a stalemate and had to negotiate some sort of a, you know, a peaceful end to the war, you know. Wow. Can you imagine a news anchor, like any news anchor doing that today? That's Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> that would be insane. Lyndon Johnson famously is said to have remarked, you know, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost America or something like that. Yeah, yeah. General Westmoreland, uh, the American general tried to ask for 200,000 more troops to fix the problem. And LBJ is just like, what, what the fuck? Like, no, you can't, like, <laughs> everyone is pissed happening? and that's, how is that going to help? Yeah. General Westmore troops, more like it. <laughs> I'm sure a, a political cartoonist did that sometime. <laughs> I'm right? sure, I'm sure. Someone like had to shit out a cartoon by the next day and they're like, okay, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> so yeah, it's a huge swing. And, you know, Johnson's like depressed about how this all falls apart. Because kind of, I mean, his lying had just caught up to him. He'd been telling everybody what they wanted to hear. And now they were seeing that that wasn't true. You know, <laughs> Consequences. They're unfortunate. Yeah. So he gets on TV March 31st. He announces a unilateral halt to bombings of North Vietnam, which they had been doing and they had been like, monstrous quote no not targeting civilians but actually frequently hitting civilians and stuff announces a halt to those bombings and then stuns everybody by saying that he was not going to run again for a second term really lbj was one term uh he was i mean he was one term in his own right he also got the rest of Kennedy's. oh term. yeah yeah that's right that's but right. he would have been able to serve for another one. Oh yeah but he did not he just you know said i'm gonna focus on the war i'm not running I won't accept wow. the nomination. I mean, that's, I feel like, big from him, because from what I know of him, he's like a very big oh, yeah. ego guy, yeah. you know? He was super power hungry, and he probably honestly thought that this gesture would, like, propel him into <laughs> somehow being selected anyway. <laughs> that's you fair. Know? Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I'll turn it down. Be right. Be modest yeah, about yeah. it. <laughs> it's a huge turning point. Again, the NLF and, and the North Vietnamese Army, they do lose the Tet Offensive strictly militarily, but I mean, if you understand war as a bigger picture of you know as the old adage goes politics by other means i mean it changed the minds of lots of people they fucked up their allies pretty good and those allies are big allies yes yeah and there's also a lot of other things that were happening to change people's mind throughout the war not just the Tet offensive there's tons of other atrocities going on and yes there are atrocities on the communist side that's true uh, you can hear about that from any story, any book about John McCain and his heroism or anybody mm -hmm. who was a POW and all the hell they had to go through. And we're not saying that wasn't bad, but we'll take a look here at some of the other atrocities that people don't talk about as much. You also got to look at it like the Americans also just have far more resources, far more options, you know, choices of do we want to really, you know, do these horrible things or not to still get what they want done. Yeah, because they had enough power to like just run people over right you know all right so in march of 1968 you have the me lie massacre okay sounds bad so far uh yeah this was march 16th uh, u.s troops in south vietnam end up killing more than 500 unarmed civilians men women children and infants whoa okay yeah we don't mean they dropped the bomb on them because i mean they did bomb and kill a lot of people that way indiscriminately but we mean they, like, were up close and personal killed. They tortured people, too, beforehand, and uh, they even stopped to have lunch during the middle of the rampage. Wow. Uh, 26 soldiers ended up charged with crimes, uh, but only one platoon leader, this asshole lieutenant named William Kelly, ends up convicted of anything. He gets a life sentence, but ends up only serving three and a half years under house arrest. Okay, so nothing, yeah. right? That's all he got. Uh, that was the Mili massacre. Obviously, people hearing about that, I think they heard about that when the trial and stuff started happening. A lot of people were disgusted by that, but a lot of people also defended William Kelly. Okay, why? They said he was just a soldier doing his job. Just following orders? I mean, a lot of them didn't care so much. I mean, it was like, I mean, he only killed some Vietnamese people is what they were saying. You know? Jesus. 
I mean, I'm sure people even said he was a hero or something weird. Like I'm that. sure. I'm sure. In throughout the course of the war, there's also the use of Agent Orange. Okay, yeah, I've heard of this. This is like some crazy chemical, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a chemical defoliant and herbicide. Okay, so there's exfoliant, but defoliant? It just takes your skin off? I think it's meant to take out like the like the trees and stuff. Oh, okay, foliage, not like skin. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Although it can do that too. It was used throughout Vietnam, millions of barrels of it. Uh, ultimately, more than 4 million people are exposed to it. It takes out nearly 12,000 square miles of forest. Oh my God. Which, I mean, environmentally, what the fuck, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Vietnam, for generations afterward, has tons of birth defects and childhood cancers. Holy shit. Uh, because of that, long-term effects from Agent Orange, produced by Monsanto and Dow Chemical. Okay, friends of the show. Yeah. <laughs> to be clear, like chemical warfare has been banned. So was the idea that like, oh no, this is just to clear trees, so it's cool? I'm not sure on the reasoning behind it. I think that they were that. Well, I mean, I know that they were trying to basically deny the NLF use of hiding in forests and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I don't know how. You know that what what the argument would be? So fucked. I mean, not that like that. If it wasn't against the law or whatever, that means it's okay, right? Yeah, that's like, true. It, it's still not okay. <laughs> People, yeah. Well, technically, yeah. Who cares? <laughs> technically, <laughs> technically, who cares? <laughs> yeah, technically, fuck you. So you have these bad things going on, and again, there's way more than that. But that coupled with the Tet Offensive, all this, you know, basically the anti-war movement in the United States starts growing. And they're doing a ton of stuff throughout the war, but really starting in 1968, it's really growing. They're resisting via dodging the draft uh, or deserting the army or doing big protests, even doing direct actions like burning down ROTC buildings and stuff like oh, that. Oh, shit. Okay. And I think this is kind of important because North Vietnam, like the political leadership there, including Ho Chi Minh and then his, his successor, because he actually dies in 1969. Oh, okay. They realize that, you know, this war, they are fighting it on the battlefield, but ultimately if they can just get the Americans to go, then they're, they're going good. to win. Yeah. So like they just need to convince, you know, basically convince the American people that it's not worth it. That it's not right. That they need to, end the war. The Tet Offensive, I think, like we said, really turned people in greater numbers against the war. And that trend continues to accelerate as these atrocities roll in and people find out more about it. And then going into the Nixon presidency, he is actually elected initially saying he's got a secret plan to, to win the war. What's the secret plan? Well, what he ends up doing is similar to what Lyndon Johnson was doing and just saying one thing and doing another. So he's, he's got this program called Vietnamization, where he's going to wind down America's involvement in terms of troops and put that more and more on the shoulders of the South Vietnamese, arm them, train them, all that. Now, where have I heard this one before? <laughs> right. This one's very familiar. <laughs> uh, and meanwhile, step up a bombing campaign in North Vietnam. I mean, yeah. Textbook. Right. Uh, that way, fewer Americans dying. Well, while he was saying that, what he was also doing was invading and bombing Cambodia near, nearby, expanding the war. Oh, my God. Okay, yeah. So this is where we get what Noam Chomsky was talking about, right? Right. I mean, they he bombs the shit out of them, bombs the shit out of Laos. He's already still bombing North Vietnam. Fuck. This is the guy that people elected to figure out a way to... To end the war. End the war, <laughs> Yeah. And now we're in, at war all over the place. <laughs> Good strategy. So that's another thing that, again, people are like, what the fuck? Like, people want to say, oh, don't be a long-haired hippie. Be legitimate. Be straight. But, like, these guys are fucking lying the whole time. Like, why would I want to, you know, why would we believe these guys? Well, this was, like, the first majorly televised war, too. Like, that was a big impact, right? Yes. And a televised in the way that, like, it was fairly unrestricted. Compared to, I mean, you did have newsreels and stuff in World War II, but that was completely run through the war office. Like, Yeah, it's just propaganda. Right, yeah. Whereas here, it's it's way more, way, way grittier what you see. Yeah, you have like reporters going out with soldiers and shit. Mm -hmm. 
And so, yeah, people are seeing more and more of it and they're like turning more and more against it. You know, GIs are coming back and saying, this is fucking bullshit and opposing it in their own way. I mean, you have troops that are like opposing it themselves. Like they, they start calling those search and destroy missions, search and avoid. And what you would do is just, it's called sandbagging. You just go out there and like find a kind of quiet place and hang out and call in fake, like radio things to your commanders and stuff and be oh, like, Oh wow. yeah, we're going here, man. It looks, you know, <gasps> but you're just actually chilling, smoking weed. <laughs> you're doing a little, uh, long distance D and D session. Yeah. Like uh, <laughs> next I'm going to shoot with my gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, because they were just fighting for their survival at that point. So many of them yeah. like really didn't want to go and just ended up there. And there's an argument to be made, baby. They should have draft dodged instead of gone. You know, uh, wars can't happen without soldiers, but even amongst those who were there, a lot of them were like, fuck this, you know? Yeah, and like dodging the draft is not easy to do. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was a criminal act. Ultimately, that kind of that kind of movement starts growing, um, especially as, as Nixon starts fucking with things. You have the release of the Pentagon Papers in 1971. Uh, a guy named Daniel Ellsberg just leaks uh, these this like uh, secret document, basically a Department of Defense history of our involvement in Vietnam up until that point. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's as embarrassing as you think it would be. <laughs> and they just published that in the times. Oh yeah. I watched a movie about this. Yeah. Was yeah. Yeah. Oh, was it know. just called the times? Maybe. Oh, uh, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's not important. But anyway, it's, 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 you know, it turns public opinion further against, against the war. And by this point, you know, there's a lot of pressure in Congress and stuff against further involvement against escalation, but encouraging more and more, let's negotiate something, you know? And so that's what Nixon starts trying to do. And it's in 1973 that they're able to get, they're able to put together the Paris Peace Accords. Uh, and the Paris Peace Accords are a, are kind of the, well, it's the end of the official American involvement in the war. And this had been going on, this negotiation process had been going on for a long time. It's <laughs> actually Lyndon Johnson had been trying to put this together. But Nixon kind of did these backdoor deals even when he was still a candidate Oh, uh, to convince the North Vietnamese that they would get a better deal with him and so not to make any deal with Lyndon Johnson. What? Okay. So he just like prolonged the war, you know. Wow. Got great. more people cool killed. Move. Yeah. Cool. Uh, but they eventually, they eventually get this agreement together. When they first put it together, like the South Vietnamese guy, the leader down there is pissed about it and he's like oh you guys are betraying me and he, he just does these shenanigans where he leaks it to the press and then the north vietnamese are like this is fucked up and so they each like kind of try to change the deal and then nixon's like this is stupid uh and he launches this bombing campaign called operation linebacker to try to force the north back to the negotiating table but by that point like people are so much more against the war that he just tells Henry Kissinger, who is this complete asshole, and we can do a oh, whole thing on sucks. him. But he's like, yeah, he's like dark force behind a lot of this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And he tells him, like, I don't care. We'll agree. To, we'll, we'll do the old agreement again. Just get them back to the table, please. So it was like uh, they they do this bombing campaign to, to get the original deal that they had. <laughs> so it's pretty embarrassing. But the Americans end up eventually signing the Paris Peace Accords, agreeing uh, to withdraw. It's supposed to be a ceasefire on both sides. It's supposed to be kind of an agreement that we're going to, this is still a temporary border or whatever, but we're going to respect each other's space and, and not do any more uh, attacks against each other. And the Americans, meanwhile, are going to leave. Not loving the use of the word supposed to be. Well, the part that really happens is the U.S. does leave. Uh, Nixon, he had promised the South Vietnamese government that he would still use the air force and bomb for them and do whatever basically to back them up if they needed it. Uh, but in Congress, they ended up passing a, an amendment, uh, the case church amendment to kind of limit the president's ability to do these secret bombing campaigns and shit like he was doing in Cambodia and Laos. Oh, shit. Okay. And so it just like limit, it was just like, no, we can't do any more in Vietnam, in Laos, in Cambodia, unless the president gets congressional approval in advance. 
And meanwhile, Nixon is just being driven out of office by Watergate. Yeah, he doesn't have a big leg to stand on here. <laughs> yeah, so he's promised <laughs> Selfie and me, like, hey, don't worry about it, I'll prop you up. But really, he Make can't Make a deal anymore. with me. <laughs> yeah. So the U.S. troops start to pull out. I mean, and they do. They I mean, they're, they're, they're largely gone in 73. Uh, but meanwhile, the supposed to be part is that both the South Vietnamese and the NLF and North Vietnamese army all start to break the ceasefire, both sides. Oh, fuck. They just start fighting again. Um, and the big change, though, is that the Americans are mostly gone. Uh, by this point, from 73 to 75, the North Vietnamese army is still kind of on its back heels, but it's rebuilding. Ever since the Tet Offensive, they started rebuilding and amping up the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And so they're putting together logistics basically for in the future, we're going to do a big offensive, right? When the Americans pull out, they're like, all right, we're coming close to, we're going to start planning our big offensive. And in 1975, they're like, we're going to do a, a test run. We're going to like attack this one place and kind of see if it provokes the Americans. Hopefully they don't come back. If they do, we'll just withdraw. It's not a big commitment. If they don't, we'll figure out how to march from there and, and eventually put together a big offensive in 1976. Well, they attack this place and just fucking overrun it. <laughs> it ends up being like way easier than they thought. It is so easy. And they're like, oh, holy fuck. shit. Uh, let's just keep going. Right. They just launch <laughs> an offensive. They're just like, let's go. We're, you know, they call it the Ho Chi Minh campaign because that's how, how like fucking, you know, confident they are at that point. Because Arvin, the, the South Vietnamese army is just rolling over. They just take off running like wholesale. And so civilians start fleeing too. And every, it's just like a route completely. They, they just set the goal for May 1st. We're going to, we're going to be marching in Saigon. Let's do it. And they do, they roll in there and they, and they besiege Saigon and take it on April 30th, 1975. Wow. Okay. So within two years of America not backing up its puppet regime, the South Vietnamese fall. Yeah. And how many years? So we were in there for 20 years? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. So we're in there for 20 years, two years, blam. It's the same thing in wow. Afghanistan, except you go from 20 years to two weeks, something like that. You know, like mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Jesus. crazy. But yeah, uh, that's, you know. Famously called the fall of Saigon uh, or the liberation of Saigon. Yeah, depending on who you talk to. So, yeah, the people there are like freaking out. They're worried there's going to be like mass executions and stuff. And not for no reason. Like we said, there were atrocities, including the massacre at Way, where the communists like briefly took, you know, did besiege and take that city and then started like rooting people out who they said had been collaborating with the South Vietnamese. But there were probably like excesses beyond that, you know? Yeah. Oh, that sucks. So people got executed. And so later they were like, oh, no, they're going to do that, you know? So people were like frantically fleeing. Meanwhile, like the American ambassador just refused to think that this was really going to happen. And so he was just like, no, we're not leaving until it was like way too late and barely anybody, you know, they evacuated mostly just the Americans and left behind so many of people who had worked with them and stuff like that. Oh, fuck. That sucks. The NLF and the North Vietnamese Army uh, captured Saigon, and that was the end of the Vietnam War or the resistance war against America. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I feel like I'm I'm trying to preempt all the the reviews we're going to get about us being biased. Mm -hmm. I mean, how we're, how bad did the communists do? I mean, we talked about that one massacre. That's pretty fucking bad. Yeah. Lots of people died in that. Um, and I mean, there, you know, there were reprisals. If you were like, you know, a real asshole who they had opposed, you faced punishment. And even after this is done and they, you know, take over the place or whatever, there aren't mass executions. So that's one thing that they were uh, concerned about is we didn't want to basically piss everybody off and show everybody that we're evil. Uh, so they were not like big, huge reprisal, you know, bloodletting in the street sort of thing. Um, they did send a lot of people off to uh, what they would call like re-education camps, mm, which for a lot of people were was fairly brief. Um, it, d it did kind of depend on like how long, how high up you were or whatever. Uh, but for a lot of people who were higher up, it was pretty bad. I mean, you, you faced yeah, like okay. concentration camp level of depravity. I mean, it was not good. 
One thing that I'm struck by whenever I'm reading the history of this is frequently when you see shit like the Huey Massacre or any of the bad things, later on they'll have a party conference where they like admit to the excesses, like the land reform thing and stuff. They're like, yeah, yeah, oh. that's kind of interesting. I mean, they're doing self criticism, but like actually doing it, it seems like. Yeah, as opposed to us, where like you have to break into a fucking government building and stuff to to get <laughs> the information of what's going on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, I mean, I, I guess I don't mean to say that it was purely clean, but it wasn't the massacre that people try to make it out to be. Yeah, and I think the context is important too. Like, I feel like there's a big narrative of like, yeah, everyone had to flee Vietnam because of the communists, and like, I'm sure that happened, like on some level. But like, we also have to remember, like, there were definitely people who fled and. And who didn't get out and like were treated badly, they were part of this really fucked up regime of like you know terrorizing Buddhists and yeah. you know doing all kinds of shit. So it wasn't just like innocent little like peasants and shit right. that were necessarily fleeing, right? Yeah, and and they're they're collaborators with that with the occupying force, and you can make all sorts of arguments. Maybe they're a moral person in some other respects or they're nice or they have a family and then, you know, okay. Or they're just doing what they had to do. Right. Yeah. And, and it's, it's hard to wade into all that. Of It is, it is like, you know, where do you draw the line? What's the human, you know, the humane thing to do or the good thing to do. There are no good choices in, in this situation. I feel like. Yeah. I think that you can definitely be critical and say going forward in the future, what can we learn about like what are good ways to deal with this? What's the best way to deal with this and stuff. But you know, ultimately I guess you can't, it comes down to being on a side <laughs> and you know, if you believe in your cause, you know, and you think it's right, you don't have to condemn your side wholly for a bad thing they did. You can be like, that was a bad thing they did, whatever it was like these concentration camps, you know, we don't, we don't like that or we don't like the massacre, you know, but still be on their side, broadly speaking. To be fair, though, the United States never says sorry for anything. Yeah, like, true. we were trying to get that fucking uh, lieutenant or whatever out. What was his mm -hmm. name? Callie, yeah. Callie. That's true. And not even just the overt massacres, but just like the, in the widespread bombing. I mean, so many people, civilians, just got their homes and their families destroyed, you know? over the course of the war. That doesn't make anything right, but we want to kind of say that there is not a godless, communist, heathen, murderous, barbarous side here, and then a moral, decent, upstanding, clean, capitalist side here. Yes, and that is definitely the narrative we get. Yeah. War is bad, and people do bad things in it. So that's what we're seeing here. And, and it is true that like lots of people were fleeing South Vietnam who had collaborated and also people who were just afraid, you know, who had been told their whole lives that like, oh, the communists are going to kill you if you're Catholic or whatever, you know, people fled and fled thereafter. And I, I honestly can't even, you know, put the blame on somebody who's, that you know, parents leave. fled from that and like believe, you know, were raised believing that. I yeah. Know, yeah. Like, I mean, you're affected by your environment. Like mm -hmm. if you grew up in South Vietnam where you're literally told the Virgin Mary's in here. Right. You know? <laughs> like, I, what are you going to do? Yeah. And I mean, honestly, lots of people saw some terrible shit perpetrated by both sides at like the local, not even the systemic level, but just like, you know, a cadre came through and wiped out some people from the village who had collaborated with the CIA or something, you know, like, that happened. We don't want to say it didn't, but... It shouldn't be one-sided the way it is often. Like, I, I feel like the narrative about the Vietnam War that I have is like, one, looked how fucked up it made all of our soldiers. It's like, well, they were doing the fucking up too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's one of the stupid things about it is we, as America, we spend so much time thinking about how it affected us and not like yeah. the millions of tons of bombs we dropped on the a country. The plates you like, were invading... Yeah. Like, look how sad it made us to do the, all those invading. But still generations later, like, are physically fucked up from it, you know? Okay, so there's that narrative. And then I, I when we're talking about the atrocity section, like, I definitely have heard those horror stories about, like, oh, they, like, grow bamboo through your fingers or whatever, you know? Like, mm, all the yeah. prisoner of war stories, like, like mm -hmm. we were talking about, like, John McCain and shit. Which, to me, I don't know if this is just, like, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but to me sound very, like, kind of racialized of like look at these savages you know yep you're not reading too much into it that was okay yep 
definitely an element. The that general uh, Westmoreland guy. Mm-hmm. He had this quote in a documentary called Hearts and Minds, where he said, "The Oriental doesn't put the same high price on life as does a Westerner. Life is plentiful. Life is cheap in the Orient." This is the guy that measured success via body count. One and the same. What the fuck? This is just straight racism at that point. Yeah. So you're not reading too too okay, much into yeah. it. That okay, that was there a was thing. racism. Yeah. So at the end of the Vietnam War, we don't want to make the whole thing about that. The country is reunified into the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, which is what it is today. Uh, there's like a provisional government period for a little bit. And then July 2nd, 1976, that's when they're officially reunified. All right. Let's start selling voting July 2nd instead of July 4th. <laughs> <laughs> After that, there's a period of time when they go to war with Cambodia. Oh, okay. Is this because like there is all that? violence there and then the communists were trying to get in well so cambodia had been the kingdom of cambodia but then the Khmer rouge the communist party there took power with the help of china and with the help of north vietnam mm -hmm. uh, the problem was that their party was run by some real assholes oh, uh, pol pot was oh yeah that guy. really fucking murderous and had this like this idealism, this like strange ideology of, of just like commanding the country into going through it into an agrarian socialism. And so he was like emptying out the cities and saying, we're all going to go Fuck. to the countryside and grow and grow things. And he's also very like anti-intellectual and there was just a bunch of fucked up stuff about it. And they had had some training from the Chinese uh, they eventually, after America was out of Vietnam, America was convincing the Chinese to give them aid, like to give them more aid. Like they were like, we can't do it, but you can help them out because they were helping them because uh, the Khmer Rouge or Cambodia at that time, I guess it was called Democratic Kampuchea, uh, started to get paranoid basically that Vietnam was going to come after them. <gasps> so they started fighting. And so the U.S. was like, cool. Yeah, they what they started the like raiding Vietnamese villages, just attacking them for fucking no reason, just just killing people there. And so Vietnam was like, "That's fucked up. We're invading you." They tried to like negotiate them with it first, but they like weren't having it. So they just invaded and knocked over the guy. They they got rid of. They sent Pol Pot into hiding, and and that regime, the Khmer Rouge regime, and set up their own, set up their own more friendly government there to, to for the people, and and ended a genocide that Pol Pot had been carrying out against his people. And you can get some real weirdos talking about this and saying like, oh, Pol Pot didn't do a genocide or anything like that. From what I can tell he did, but I'd welcome any sources to check out like more about it. I really did not dive too much into that. Yeah, that could be a whole but, episode for sure. I mean, another example of like being scared of someone attacking you can lead to like you attacking them and mm -hmm. then them actually attacking you. <laughs> Paranoia is a powerful drug. Vietnam uh, got rid of their regime and thereby ended uh, the Cambodian genocide there. Nice. Uh, which was, I mean, yeah, it was good. Like, I mean, nobody was doing anything about that. Yeah, more than the U U.S. fucking did. Yeah. And so then the U.S. and China were aiding and even in some cases training uh, Khmer Rouge troops in exile. Okay. Uh, the U.S. wasn't directly doing it, but like Jimmy Carter's... One of his guy, one of the guys working with him, Brzezinski, was encouraging the Chinese and saying, "Like we can't directly do it, but you should totally do it." But yeah, why was the chi why was China doing it? China was doing that mainly because they were anti-Soviet at the time. Oh, that fucking Sino split again. Yeah, and the Soviet Union was friends with Vietnam, who actually like North Vietnam had lost its aid from China at some point in the war oh, no. when they refused to give up Soviet aid. Oh, so, that like that was that was the split, and that that you know that, that ruined fucking them. split, man. I hate that thing. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the and the Americans for their part were mainly like doing you know just getting revenge, I guess, against North Vietnam and so, against now Vietnam itself, and just saying like, and even before then, Kissinger, uh, 
under Ford had been telling, I think he told Thailand, hey, like, let them know, let the Khmer Rouge know, we'll work with them, we're willing to work with them. Uh, they may be wow. murderous thugs, but we'll still work with them, sort of thing. But they don't like our enemies. What the right. fuck? So, so it's, it's not ideological, is the fucking thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, at this point, just revenge. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know, I guess America does like to kind of wring its hands and say, oh, look at this horrible genocide, look at what the communists did. Which, again, that was an ostensibly communist party doing a really bad thing. I yeah, mean, they fuck were that. committing genocide. Uh, but, but also, uh, for some reason, the United States supported them. So, like, right, pretty, yeah. pretty sus. Yeah. And there's weird CIA connections and stuff all involved that I haven't dug into enough to Oof. actually allege them. So, let's add it to the doc. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a possibility of some sort there. Uh, overall, I guess what I mean to say is Vietnam goes to war end defeats the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia, eliminates that genocide from happening. That's kind of in their foreign policy. They're still kind of arguing with China, you know, at that time. And at that point, they're struggling to rebuild from the ashes. Uh, they just got their country bombed to fucking hell all over the place, you know, and they finally put it back together just geographically. And now they've got to rebuild, you know, with a massive embargo put in place. Of course. I mean, the U S oh, is not yeah. going to trade with them after all that. So they've got, you know, the capitalist world against them, China, not even playing ball. Uh, so they've got like the Soviet union and that's about and it. That's it. Yeah. The Eastern Bloc countries. And, uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a rough place. They are trying, they're trying initially to just do socialism, right? Just to have a non-market economy, you know, to have a planned economy and doing, I mean, doing it in five year plans and everything. That's what they were trying to do. This is really hard for them and it's slow going. This is, you know, so they're reunited in 1976 and they really muddle through for 10 years. Oof, okay. Not good. Uh, and especially with the war on Cambodia, they have wartime conditions again, basically mm -hmm. in terms of the economy, they're struggling a hundred percent. A lot of starving, I'm assuming. There's shortages and it's not, I mean, people's life expectancy and like, uh, income per capita, all those like living standards things drop. And it's in 1986 that the party meets and says, this is not working. We've got to change something. We've got to do something different. The material conditions that we are facing don't match up with what we're trying to do is ultimately what it comes down to. They're not coming there and they're saying, oh, communism is, you know, we it's guess bad. we're not doing that anymore. Yeah. yeah. Throw it in the trash. They're, I guess, good Marxist Leninists in that way. You know, and, and looking at the problem and saying, okay, we've got to try to fix this. Let's see what the facts are. How can we pursue socialism given the situation we're in? Okay. What do they do? All right. So they passed some reforms called doi moi. Okay. All right. And this is uh, economic reforms in a similar vein to what China does under Deng Xiaoping, which is kind of liberalizing their economy a little bit. All right. Interesting. We kind of talked about this way back when we were talking about China's development and whether it was socialist and things like that. And so it's interesting because this is, this is similar in, in terms of what they face. They, they face the world arrayed against them and they're rebuilding from nothing. They're rebuilding from nothing. They don't have the capabilities of basically running socialism through their government. And so they say, we're going to instead go for a socialist oriented market economy. I think that makes sense. So like I'm reading Conquest of Bread right now, and a lot of it is talking about things from like an industrialized perspective of like, hey, we have the ability to produce all this shit. So mm -hmm. like, let's do this, like yes. let's move forward and provide for people. But if you don't have the ability to provide for people, like you can't provide for people. Like, I don't know how right. to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's again, being realistic with the material conditions there and saying, like, what do we have to do? Now, this is not to say, again, that they abandon communism. <laughs> Make a full capitalist monster. Yeah, nothing <laughs> like that. So, so they do introduce basically market reforms or liberalizing it or some capitalism, right? I mean, there's private enterprise and stuff and businesses and things like that. But there's still a lot of regulation like that. And that's kind of, uh, that started in 1986 and developed over time. They gradually even had to kind of liberalize more than that uh, because they were trying to get aid from the, our friends of the show, the IMF, the International no. Monetary Fund. 
uh, which made certain demands, but, uh, and, and they weren't good demands. I mean, it was like, you know, limits on what you could do. Basically Fuck. at that point though, they were like kind of out of friends. Cause in 1986, shortly thereafter, you had the collapse of the Soviet union, your main trading partner. So it's the, in that sense, it's really bad. You know, it's, it's fuck. We're going to get opened up by the world bank, the IMF and all the capitalist assholes. On the other hand, I think that Vietnam has kind of held on to some of their socialist roots, uh, and ultimately their socialist goals well enough to be, so we can sit back and say like, yeah, okay, you're not doing socialism right now. Sure. But it does still at least look like they're aimed at it. I mean, that's more than a lot of folks can say. Yeah. And, you know, I, I definitely don't agree with everything that China does, for example. But I think it is possible that maybe they're doing the same thing. Because to me, these look similar. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. They're like reassessing where are we? And it's a similar time period, too, for them. Where are we? What do we need to, you know, do we need to change things? You know, they are very, very businessy in both of these countries. You know, there's a lot of capitalism going on. I do think that the state's pretty robust and is at least declaring and showing some, uh, showing some leanings toward trying to do socialist things. Yeah, I think that's when you get into the question, though, of like, is that possible to like slowly transition, you know? Yeah. And it's a good question. I think that it is different from like social democracy, right? It, because essentially here, the government is still, and in Vietnam and everything, the government still maintains like the commanding heights of the economy, as Lenin would say. It's like the majority of, there are state owned enterprises. There are, uh, you know, areas that the government just has nationalized and stuff. And the government is still, you know, it's, it's a one party state. I mean, the government is still in charge and there's no capitalist party that's trying to just straight do cap, you know, like there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different situation. It's different from voting in socialism, right. Or electing Bernie Sanders to make some changes <laughs> or something like, I think it is different from that. Now you're still right. Will that actually work long term? Because we don't know. We can't tell whether in China or in Vietnam or in any of the places trying to do this, whether they're actually going to ever make that turn or whether they're instead going to, as they would say in like Mao times, like take the capitalist road and instead, you know, corrupt over to back to capitalism. So would you say, for example, because we're talking about, I guess, current nations in mm -hmm. socialist zones, where would Cuba fall into this? Cuba would be counted as an, as what the communists call the actually existing socialist states. So, okay, so they're doing socialism. Yeah, but again, you see this reassessment of the material conditions because they've recently allowed for some more types of businesses, private mm. businesses to exist. So there, I don't know, I guess it's not black and white as much as maybe when we first started, we kind of saw it as and just like, oh, that's easy. I'll categorize, <laughs> you know, this as socialist or not socialist. And uh, there's a continuum, a, you know, a spectrum I guess, and you can kind of, even if you're, I guess for me, the key thing is, are you governed by a communist party that is democratic from the people? And you can make a lot of criticism about the, these, these governments that maybe don't have as much democracy as we would like to see, uh, in terms of people really getting a say, although it's debated about the propaganda, you know, what do we actually receive? You know, how does Vietnam stack up in that? Uh, I mean, they have a one party state, you know, they have, they have the communist party of Vietnam and it's, but I mean, is it democratic? It faces the same criticisms, I guess, is that it's, it's not seen to be democratic. It's, it has, uh, the criticism that you can say, you know, okay, they do run a one party state. Uh, well, remember when we talked about the Soviet union thing of like, if you don't get a majority sort of, mm -hmm. like, that's the only way you can really reject people. Um, you have like internal party democracy. You know, you, you can make decisions basically of your leaders in the communist party. Uh, but like, you know, their most recent legislative election, they had 99% of their voters turn out, well, you know, they may be mandatory. I don't know. And they voted 90, 97% for the presidential, you know, candidate that was there. What? So it's, so it's very, you know, like one-sided in that way. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things. Uh, okay. I don't love that. 
I do. Yeah, I do. That's just something I want to investigate more because we receive a lot of this from any of any of these countries, you know, in Cuba or Vietnam or China that like, that's just a hundred percent not democratic. Uh, I do kind of want to like read more about party democracy about like, to what extent do they have a say in the communist party itself? It doesn't, uh, you know, if, I mean, if you get to choose your leaders within that and then they tell you, okay, well, here are the leaders you can vote for Duh, you're going to vote for them. Yeah. That's my question in general. Yeah. Because I think when we hear one party system, we're like, well, that's not democracy. And it's like, I mean, it doesn't fucking matter if you are electing the lower level party officials, then like it's still a democracy. Yeah, it's just it's a not, different form. It's not, it's, it's not the one we're familiar democracy. with. Yeah. We're not, <laughs> it's not two parties being like, I'll do this and then I'll do this. Like it's right. a, just a different version of it. So I'd be interested. I think that's a, that would be a great future and big episode topic would be yeah. what is, you know, democracy and communism and stuff like yeah what the know? fuck <laughs> yeah because <laughs> uh, we just don't know enough like we, we i don't know i don't i don't i don't feel like i know enough to give listeners an accurate view of that without either being like no it's fine whatever they do or no they're <laughs> terrible you know believe everything you hear from cnn about it or something yeah exactly all right more to learn yeah but ultimately i guess that's where vietnam ends up is with this more liberalized economy with a, a very much a mix, you know, they are still doing some socialist policies in terms of like social welfare and looking out for people, uh, in terms of like, uh, price regulations on like basic commodities of rice and stuff, which they run through, not like taxing people, but by just taking it from rice exporting companies and stuff oh, like that. Okay. So they, they basically make the business to pay for it. You know, they, they have these things, but it's mixed with this, you know, I mean, very outwardly and I guess att they attempt to contain it, but it is capitalism. I mean, it's running, mm -hmm. you know, it's just not running as a political form, just like economically. Interesting. So how are they on things like, like healthcare? <laughs> In healthcare, it's a, it's a, it's a single, it's, it's state provided. It's hundred percent. Um, it doesn't always have its resources because, again, it only recently opened up like trade with with other people with yeah the West in general. But they yeah they have their own state provided that they have a lot of their stuff is also run through workers cooperatives. Ooh, basically the the government makes it difficult to start your own private enterprises, but they make it easy to start a cooperative. That's cool. So yeah, they kind of nudge people in that direction. So they have a lot of public transportation and stuff, and generally socially provided things like that. But it's not to say it's with, not without its problems. There's there's a whole bunch of, you know, social issues that any country would go through. Yeah, I was going to ask about like standard of living and stuff. Deep poverty defined as the percentage of people living on less than a dollar a day has declined significantly in Vietnam and the relative poverty rate is now less than that of China, India, and the Philippines. That's not bad. Yeah, pretty good. The Vietnamese economy will become the world's 21st largest by 2025. Okay, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> I don't sure. Know that's good. <laughs> yeah, unsure. I would say that it's, I guess, to me, encouraging that you can have a government that's still trying to do it, but I guess that is so, sort of being reasonable. And, I, you know, again, with that, you can really get into arguments with communists, especially. Oh, yeah. You know, but being reasonable about, I think, about the, this, the situation and realizing that we've got to deal with our, the situation in front of us and figure out from there, you know, maybe they fuck up and they never fix it. You know, and they never go back. But hey, they're still around. They're not occupied by the United States. So there's that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they they won against the fucking United States. That's a big deal. All right. Uh, that's what I have to get us kind of up to speed on the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. Awesome. Well, yeah, uh, there's a lot more we could dive back into. So I, I feel like I got to go update our episode list now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a springboard, you know. And I think we, you know, at the end there, we kind of got into some of the things we're interested in learning more about, I think is, I don't know, is, is actually existing social estates, like finding out more about them, like, yeah, like peeling back what we're told about them. Yes, definitely. And also what, like what, maybe what we want to believe, like maybe, maybe we're being mm -hmm. too optimistic, you know, and, and it isn't a good idea to do what they're doing. All right. What are we talking about next time? Next time, we're going to get into some reading. I hinted at it earlier, but we've been reading Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. Yeah. Hey, excellent. is that right? That's great. So for all of you anarchists who've been tearing your hair out about <laughs> how we've been supporting this, you know, Marxist-Leninist state, 
<laughs> Hold on. Gritting your teeth as all these, you know, tanky talking points, you know, hurl past you. Don't worry. Yeah, we'll. <laughs> We're going to do some anarchism next. If you want to read that, you can get that for free. Just literally Google Conquest of Bread free PDF. And I got it from the Anarchist Library. They also have an audiobook version. I'm going to tell you I did not enjoy it. The narrator was just very flat. Um, but um, I ended up having to buy the audiobook. That's fine. Fair enough. In the meantime, you can find us online. We are on Twitter at Teach Communism, Instagram at Teach Me Communism. You can shoot us an email, teachmecommunism at gmail.com. Any of those places are great for feedback or questions or criticism or like, hey, I found this cool source about XYZ, like check it out. Um, yeah. So yeah, do that. Also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It's a super helpful way to help people find the show and get our get our brand out there. <laughs> yes, brand recognition. Yeah, we want to be, be the, the cool ones. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, please do that rate and review. You don't have to be an Apple user to do that. Anyone can do it. So that'd be awesome. Yeah. And we also have YouTube. If that's how you prefer to listen to podcasts, check that out. And finally, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash teach me communism. For five bucks a month, you get access to our notes for this episode. This time it'll be Grady's notes, obviously, which are very helpful. Thanks. And you also get access to the backlog. So I use that frequently just to look up questions and shit whenever yeah. listeners send us questions i'm like what did gray say about it a few months ago <laughs> <laughs> and the money from that at the end of the year will go to a local mutual aid fund gray do you want to guess how much money we have in that right now oh man uh three hundred dollars it's five hundred dollars dude wow yeah crazy. i'm like so excited like we might get to split it up among a couple of organizations hell yeah that'd be great so that'll go to, I, I love Dallas Feed the People. That's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, I'll be looking into more mutual aid orgs in the DFW area. Yeah, we'll make sure we get it to people doing good work amongst our comrades. Hell yeah. Okay, cool. Also, we're going to be releasing shirts soon. I'm still not sure on the launch date of those because I'm just paranoid. So I don't know. <laughs> I want to make sure everything looks good first. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for being a great student. Yeah, thanks for teaching me. And thank you, dear listeners, for tuning in. You guys are awesome. Uh, you can tune in next week for another episode of Teach Me Communism, where the class struggle is always in session. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.